Let's do. Summation. Let's get crazy. X to the 3n times 3n factorial divided by 2n factorial. So I can already tell ratio test is definitely the way to go. Almost any factorial series you want to go with ratio test. So go ahead and apply the ratio test here. So I am already skipping steps on this ratio test. Wasn't it x to the 3n? Yep. Yeah. So it was x to the 3n. <coughs> I'll do the x part separately. So we x to the 3n plus x cubed, or x to the 3n plus 3. So I recommend you don't skip steps until you've been doing this for a very long time. So that's the x simplification right there, how I got x cubed. The other one, simplifications are a little more straightforward. Just make sure you're very careful. You get 3n plus 3 factorial, not 3n plus 1 separately. You got to distribute your 3. All right, any questions on that algebra? Any of this algebra on the board here. So this is not row yet. We're going to take a limit, and that's going to be row. So anytime you're left with, um, <coughs> wait, after you've simplified and you still have the factorial, you just write them out. Yeah, you just pull out enough terms or factor out enough terms until you can cancel the factorial, basically. So one of them had like two extra terms, the other one had three extra terms. But you need to be very careful about what's what's what, basically. How did you learn about canceling the factorial from like the second step to that first step that you have there? Uh, there's basically three more terms in the numerator here. So it's a, uh, there'd be another three N factorial and 3n factorial on the bottom basically that, that would cancel out to 1. Wouldn't the bottom one be 2n? So yeah, there'd be another <coughs> there'd be another one out there. 
I wrote, I, this is combining together the, the reduced version of those, both of them at the same time. So I'm skipping steps is what I'm saying. You should have more steps. At least you should have every step I have and probably one or two steps in between these steps. I'm just trying to avoid having a problem take up uh, two and a half pages again. Because <laughs> the, finding the radius of convergence is like halfway there. And then we have to individually check the two endpoints. So we're not even halfway done yet. All right, what can I take out of this limit? To x cube. It's constant, so x cubed can be brought out. So what is this limit after we remove the x cubed? What rule could I use here? So I'm going to get infinity over infinity, so one option is local What? So we're approaching infinity, and this works when you're approaching infinity or negative infinity. You can basically ignore the low, the plus 3, plus 2, and the plus 1. So I don't care about that plus 3, plus 2, plus 1 anymore. Only because I'm approaching infinity. If I was approaching any number, I would not be able to do this. So we got 3n times 3n times 3n. Denominator is 2n times 2n. Again, all we're doing is ignoring the plus the constant right there. So I'm ignoring all the plus constants. So the bottom would be square, the top would be cubed, so we go to infinity. Yep. So we got basically 3 cubed on the top times n cubed, and then 2 squared and squared. So that's 27 fourths. And what is this easy limit? Infinity. Infinity. So rho is x cubed, absolute value of x cubed times infinity. When is this going to be greater than 1? Almost always. There's one chance. What's the 1x value that will, you really have to look at it up here before you take your limit. What's the 1x value that would not give us infinity? Zero. zero. So if x is zero, before you take your limit, you're going to have zero times that thing. So you'll get zero. So this is rho is greater than one. It's actually infinity. But specifically, rho is greater than one for all x not equal to 0. So again, are there any logic questions as to why that's a true statement, given this our... Only converges at zero. This only converges at 0. Of every other x value, it's going to diverge. So convergence in row is less than 1, which happens only when x is 0. So if I draw out our interval of convergence on the number line, it's not terribly exciting. It's that. So what is the radius of this interval? Zero. zero. So there's no, we're not going anywhere to the left or right, so we're going zero to the left or right. So in this case, we say radius equals zero. You shouldn't really write an interval notation this is technically incorrect, although I'll know what you mean if you write this. The interval from 0 to 0, including 0. But the better way to write it, this is not standard notation right here. You want to write it in set notation, where you just put the single element inside there. So the proper way to write this out is just the set with 0 inside of it. So this is our interval of convergence. Our radius is 0. This is the other extreme where your power series converges for almost no x values, just a single x value. So the last 
two problems. One of them, we had an infinite radius up here. So no matter what x was, it was going to converge. And then the last example we did was the other extreme, which is it almost never converges except when every term is 0. So we're going to look at multiplying power series. Or this will all be under algebra on power series. Is the plural of series just to get an extra ES? On power series is. Maybe it is like mice or moose. <laughs> Mooses. <laughs> what is it? Plural of ox is oxen. So what's the plural of box? <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right, multiply a power series. <coughs> Let's just multiply uh, a few terms of a power series. So I'll just choose ones that we did in examples already. I'm going to uh, write out the expanded versions. Um, I'll write, I guess I'll write the uh, closed form first. So we just did an n factorial x to the 3n. And another one we did. I'm going to do a relatively simple one. That's too easy. We'll use that one. Example in your notes with the three and the five in it. I don't want to keep scrolling around. All right, I'm just going to write the uh, example we did, but not cent just centered at zero. All right. So let's multiply these power series out. I'm going to write the first couple terms and then just with a dot, dot, dot after that. So on here on the left series, our first term will be, remember, 0 factorial is 1. So it's going to be 1x to the 0 plus 1 factorial is 1x cubed. 2 factorial is 2x to the 6th. 3 factorial is 6, x to the ninth. Now I'm just going to write plus dot dot dot. So I just wrote the first few terms of that series. Now I'm going to write the first few terms of the second series. We're starting at 1 over here. So this is x. So 3x over... 1 times 5, so 3x over 5, plus 9, plus 27x cubed over 125. All right, the reason I'm writing these out is because I want you to see that multiplying power series is really tricky. What do I actually have to do to multiply these two together? Distribute. distribute. So no problem, we'll just distribute an infinite number of terms across an infinite number of terms. Which will take an infinite amount of time. Which will only take an infinite amount of time. It just, it's, 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 yeah. 
So there is actually a way to do this systematically. The only issue is you need an infinite amount of time. That's the only drawback. Uh, what you're going to do is you basically multiply the first term by the first term, and then the first term by the second term, and then the second term by the other first term. So we'll multiply the two initial terms together. Next to the 0, of course, is just 1. So we'll just leave that guy as 1. So we have 3x over 5. And now we'll multiply the uh, x cubed by 3x over 5. So that's 3x to the fourth over 5. And let's see, now we'll go. The Oh, yes, there is. 25, yep, that'll be 50. And then the next one will be something else. 375. 375, yeah. So now we have plus. I'm multiplying the 1 by the 9x squared over 50. So one way to think about this, this is the zero order term. This is the order one term, meaning it's a zero term times a one term or a one term times a zero term. And the next set over here will be the three term, meaning the first term times the first term right there. So that is 9x to the fifth over 50. And then I'll multiply the first term times a third term. And now the third term times the first term. 6x to the seventh. Are you still proving this is tricky, or are we? Oh, you should be thoroughly convinced this is tricky at this point. <coughs> All right, so you can't systematically multiply them out. The only problem is it's an infinite system, so we can't actually, we can't even write the terms out of the two series individually because that would take an infinite amount of time. So we can't really multiply them together. All right. I would just leave it as the first one right there. So anytime that you're actually dealing with an infinite series in practice, the way you deal with it, is you just write out, well, you don't write out, you have a computer write out the first 50 terms or 100 terms and say that that's good enough. All right, there's also more. So this is where we write dot, 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 because we've had enough. All right, this series right here that I wrote down doesn't really look like the two series it came from because it's kind of some term off one series multiplied by another term off the other series, and all things are kind of mixed together. So it's not going to follow a very good pattern. Also, you're not allowed to reorder terms in infinite series unless you know it converges already. One of the issues is these two series have very different intervals of convergence. So the interval of convergence of the product is going to be the intersection of the interval of convergence of the original series. So if you know the two interval of convergence, one for each of these series, the intersection of those intervals is the interval of convergence of the product. So I'll write interval of convergence over here of convergence. The interval of convergence of the product of two series is the intersection of their intervals of convergence. So let's go and compute that. 
Actually, this one's going to be really easy to compute. What is the interval convergence of our first series? We just did that problem. It was 0. So it's probably going to be an easy intersection. Either 0 is in the second set, or it's not in the second set. It does not converge, yeah. So our first interval was 0. Our second interval, we have to modify it a little bit. I think it was, I centered it at 0. So it's going to move over to 0. I think it was 5 thirds. Was that right? So 5 thirds. Is that two pages back in your notes. It was centered at 4, but we're resetting it. Yeah, it was, and it was closed on the left, open on the right. All right, what's the intersection of 0 and this interval? 0. So in this case, one interval is super small, so small that the other interval it didn't matter how big it was, the intersection is going to be 0. It's way more exciting if you have one interval here and another interval right here, and then you intersect those two. So that's way more exciting than what we just did. If you had this situation, your intersection would look like this right here. So you just want to graph them out and see what's in common. You got to be careful about endpoints, uh, open, close. That makes a big difference. But number lines, one of the best ways to think about intervals. So we have a theorem before we get into calculus on power series. So hypothesis, if summation a n x to the n converges absolutely, for absolute value x less than some radius r. Then summation a n times a function of x to the n converges absolutely. for all x values such that f of x is less than r. So our example for this theorem I'm going to take that series <coughs> centered at 0. And given that we know what that interval of convergence is, I want to find the inter interval of convergence of a slightly different series. So this series looks quite a bit different. However, I carefully wrote it out so it would be similar. 
So what are some key differences? It's the multiple of two on the bottom. So we got that 10 instead of the 5. So let's rewrite that 10 to the end so it looks like something that contains 5 to the n. So how can I write 10 to the n is what times 5 to the n? 2 to the n times 5 to the n, you multiply bases and you get 10 to the n right there. So let's go ahead and rewrite that. All right, fractions of fractions are always extra tricky. So we gotta be a little extra careful with that. So what I need to do is, there was no two to the n in the original, so I have to get this inside the power series part of this series. So I have to put, get that inside the parentheses. Good news is that's easy to do. Yeah, so yeah, the reciprocal of 2 is a half, and then I moved it inside the n power. Right there. All right, we're almost there. Just 9 times 2 is 18. All right, any algebra questions before we jump up and use that theorem? So all I did was I wanted to manipulate this series into a form that was pretty much identical to the original series. The only difference is the power part, meaning what's inside the nth power, I'm going to modify that. All right, once we're here, now I can say that this, what I just circled, is going to be f of x. So now... This function f of x is this x squared over 18. So I can rewrite our series as 3 to the n over n, 5 to the n, times f of x to the n. And now this looks really similar to our theorem. So any questions about that rewriting with f of x? So now let's go up and read that theorem again. Theorem says, if converges absolutely, now <clears throat> this absolute convergence means it converges for uh, absolutely for the absolute value of those terms. We used absolute convergence or absolute value to get that 5 thirds, what we use conditional convergence for was at the endpoint to get the convergence. So this series will converge absolutely if I just ignore the endpoints. That's the only time I use conditional convergence was at that one endpoint. So converges absolutely on this open interval. So I just, the only time I used conditional convergence was for that one endpoint. So I can say it converges absolutely right here. So using this theorem, so I satisfy the hypothesis, it converges absolutely. What is R? Is the radius. So specifically, it's 5 thirds. It's the width of the interval, or the half the width of the interval. So here's our radius. So it converges absolutely for x less than, absolute value of x less than 5 thirds. So <clears throat> that theorem, our x uh, needs to be absolute value less than 5 thirds. So the new series is going to converge absolutely for f of x less than 5 thirds. So we sat satisfy the hypothesis for that theorem.
So our new series converges absolutely for absolute value f of x less than r, and we'll sub in the value for f of x, and r was 5 thirds. So what I'm going to do now is solve for x. So what's the first step to solve for x? Multiply by 18. Multiply by 18. Sounds good. So if whatever 5 times 18 is, it is 90. Let's do 18 over 3 is 6 times 5 is 30. Why am I allowed to erase the absolute value on x squared? Because it's always going to be positive. Because it's always going to be positive. So you can take a square root here. However, this is not a linear inequality. This is a quadratic inequality. So we covered these in pre-calculus 1. I know that's probably over a year ago for most of you. So how do we solve? Uh, polynomial inequalities, we basically get 0 on one side and then graph the other side. So we're going to get 0 on one side, so I'm going to subtract 30 on both sides. And we already used the name f of x, so I'll let g of x equal x squared minus 30. And now I want to answer the question, when is g of x less than 0? So I'm going to graph... Oh. Yeah, go for it. It's probably easier if you do it, Andrew. The, the only switch over there is hit. I think you have to hold it, unfortunately. All right, so I'm going to graph x squared minus 30. Super easy to graph, sad parabola. Looks like that. How do I get my x intercepts? Uh oh. Oh, it's a sad parabola shifted up 30. I need a happy parabola shifted down 30. That looks more like a part of a circle, but it's good enough. How do I get my x-intercepts? Plug in 0 for x. If plug in 0 for x, I get the y-intercept. Oh, plug in 0 for y. Plug in 0 for y, and I'll get my x-intercepts. So add 30, and x equals square root 30, plus or minus. All right, so when is g of x less than 0? It is less than 0 for all the smile part of the parabola. So we're not in including the x-intercepts, but everything between the x-intercepts. So our solution, whenever x is between negative square root 30 and positive square root 30, this is our new interval of absolute convergence. Now, you do need to test the endpoints individually. So you have to test square root 30 and negative square root 30 to decide does it converge at one or both of the endpoints. Unfortunately, that theorem doesn't help you out at the endpoints. It just helps you out on the open interval part of it. So you have to test the endpoints separately, uh, which I'm not going to go and do. It's exactly the same as testing the two endpoints in any other problem. All right, so if you know the convergence of one power series and you have a similar one, meaning it's just a function of x away from being your previous power series, you can get the interval of convergence by using this method right here. Just figure out what your radius is, basically, what your function is, and then use the theorem. Up next, we're going to do derivatives of power series.
I'll use CN as a coefficient. All right, derivative power series. Power series is a sum of terms. So how do derivatives react to sums? So the derivative of the sum of two terms, you can just take the derivative of each of the two terms and then add those derivatives together. What that looks like in this notation, it's a little strange, but it means you can change the order of the sum and the derivative operator. So this is what it looks like to distribute across addition. It looks like you're commuting the operators. So this is the sum rule for derivatives. It doesn't look like it. It looks like we're changing the order of two operations. But what it corresponds to is the distributing across the sum. So any questions about that idea? What is it called? Uh, it's the uh, sum rule is what we're using. So if I wrote it out with the prime notation, actually it's probably better if I wrote it out with the DDX notation. So that's the rule right there. All right, now for the easiest derivative ever, find the derivative of this series on the right. It's probably 10 times easier than you're thinking. You could have done this in calculus one, probably the fourth week of class. What's this derivative? Remember, it's not an n derivative. So n is not the variable for the derivative operator. What's the variable for the derivative? X. X. So what's the derivative? One. No. If n were equal to 1, it would equal this group. So it's n times x minus a to the n minus 1. And then just carry your constant down. I'm intentionally blocking out that summation, because I don't want you to look at that. It has nothing to do with the derivative. So this is cn times n times x minus a to the n minus 1. So this is the power rule. Nothing else going on. Of course, we have to rewrite the summation. All right, so that was an easy calculus question. It was just a power rule derivative. What will the initial term be? When n equals 0, what term would we get? When n equals zero out of here, uh, x minus a to the negative one. You get x minus a to the negative one, which is kind of strange. Not a, po a polynomial, because it's a negative one is a one over. Times zero. Times zero. So you get zero. So we actually get zero for our initial term, which means I can instead of starting at zero, I can actually start it up at one because the zero term is going to give me zero. So we'll just go ahead and start it up at one. One way to think of this is you're losing your constant term. That's one way to think about it. Whatever your degree zero term was, that term's going to disappear. So you'll have one less term than you started with. All right, so there's a derivative. That's how to get a derivative of a power series. It's pretty easy to compute. And good news is, for interval of convergence, your radius of convergence stays the same when you take derivatives. So your radius of convergence is unchanged. And again, your endpoints need to be checked individually.
So if you remember way back to, when did we learn this? I think this is pre-calculus one class again. You saw this equation written with R's. What series was this called? Geometric series. I'm going to write it with X's. It won't change anything. So this is a geometric series. This is not true for all X values. What X values is this true for? Or what is the radius of convergence? Definitely converges when x equals 0, for sure. It's a power series centered at 0. Anybody remember how big x can get? What happens if x is 1? So if x is 1, we add up and get infinity. So it's not going to work when x equals 1. So hopefully this rings a bell. When absolute value x is less than 1, it converges. All right. This is a power series that converges when absolute value of x is less than 1. Now we're going to find the power series for the natural log of 1 minus x. How in the world can I turn a natural log of 1 minus x into this 1 over 1 minus x? Derivative is the answer to half the questions I ask you. It's a good default. All right. Probably the most common correct answer to the questions I ask you. All right, what is the actual derivative of ln of 1 minus x? It's almost 1 over 1 minus x. What's negative 1 over 1 minus x? That's the derivative there. All right, I want to solve for how do I get rid of this ddx right here? I can't multiply by dx over d. That'd be neat. How do I get rid of d over dx? Integrate. So how do we get rid of a derivative? We're going to integrate both sides. Now when I say integrate, I mean integrate both sides. You can't just do something to one side of an equation and forget about the other side. So I need to integrate both sides. So on the left side, integral cancels the derivative. I do have a plus constant, however. So that will show up. Does that show up on both sides? Uh, you could write two constants, one on each side but you add them together, collect them on one side, and you'll just get one constant. Yeah, I think we had that in, um, we did the differential equations briefly, where we integrated both yeah. sides and collected constants on one side. So basically, it doesn't matter what side you put the constant on, as long as there's a plus constant somewhere. All right, so you should believe this now. I'm going to solve for ln 1 minus x. Oh, yeah. it's right there. No problem.
All right, we're almost done. We have solved for ln1 minus x. The only thing we need to do now is substitute in that power series. That was that initial fact that I wrote, the recall at the very, very top. I'll scroll up so we can see that. Oh, and I still left out the integral, integral dx. So all I did was I substituted out for the 1 over 1 minus x, the power series that we wrote at the very beginning right there. So I took out 1 over 1 minus x and replaced it with the power series right next to it. So good news is the integral has a sum rule as well. So I can push the antiderivative inside the sum, just like I can push the derivative inside of a sum. So this can be summation, 0 to infinity, integral x to the n dx. What is the antiderivative of x to the n? So we have to unsubtract okay. one. So I like to guess on my antiderivatives. I've been doing them for a while, so I'm pretty good at guessing. And then I check to make sure by taking a derivative. So I have to have a bad guess and then take a bad derivative to actually be wrong. All right, unfortunately, we've got to stop here. We'll pick this up Monday. We're basically done right here, though. We're just going to solve for c by picking an easy x value, probably zero, and then figuring out what c needs to be.